Good evening. I'm Bill Dickinson. I am a member of uh, the Alexandria War of 1812 Bicentennial Planning Committee, and uh, we've been working on a series of events uh, for probably the last year and a half. Uh, Gretchen Bulova has been our uh, organizer, our, our, our driver, let's put it that way. Peter Pennington has been a member of the team. Um, you see Mark Radford, uh, Radford from uh, Carlisle House, who's been quite a number of people there, and I better not getting into naming them all because I'm going to forget some. Um, this is the last of our Alexandra War of 1812 Bicentennial Lectures. We've had quite a number of uh, lectures with the Alexandra Historic Society uh, and co-sponsored with the Office of, His of Historic Alexandra. Tonight, uh, we're privileged to be here. Thank you to the Masonic Temple for making this glorious space available. <laughs> and also to the law firm, uh, which is sponsoring this event tonight, uh, of um, McGuire Wood, Woods. Um, and I thank very much Jonathan Rack, one of their attorneys, for uh, making this happen. And it's so appropriate, I think, that, uh, that he, that this firm be the sponsor, since uh, if they were around in 1814, 1815, I suspect they would have been involved in, in doing the work on coming up with the Treaty of Ghent. They have offices in London. They have offices in Brussels. They have offices in Richmond and in Washington. So uh, just a different time. Tonight, I'm very honored uh, to present to you Andrew Lambert, Professor Andrew Lambert of King's College, um, London. Um, he is the uh, Lawton Professor of Naval History, and he will be our keynote speaker, as he has been for the last two days, uh, at a symposium involving many scholars on the War of 1812 at Decatur House, an event that some of you uh, were already, uh, already attended, uh, that was sponsored by the White House Historical Association, the U.S. Capitol uh, Historical Society, and Montpelier, James Madison's Montpelier. It was a, a mind-boggling, uh, wonderful experience, uh, very elegantly done and I think we all learned much. Um, Professor Lambert is the author of the highly acclaimed book, Nelson, Britannic, Britannia's God of War, that was in 2004, and more recently, this book, uh, which I, it was hard to find, but I did read it, The Challenge, Britain's, uh, Britain Against America in the Naval War of 1812, and this won the Anderson Medal uh, in the UK for the best naval book of uh, 2014. Uh, uh, Dr. Lambert also wrote and presented BBC's television series War at Sea, so you may have seen him before. Um, he's now writing a biography of Captain Napier, um, captain of the 36-gun frigate Uralis, um, one, one of the frigates which joined Captain James Anderson Gordon's um, ship, uh, the Seahorse, accompanied by a number of other ships that ascended the Potomac River in 1814 in a pincer movement that was supposed to have Washington in the center. Things got off. He'll get into the story a little bit, but the timing got off a little bit, so that um, that naval squadron arrived here shortly after the British withdrew their forces from Washington, D.C. Captain Napier would become one of the most popular and visionary British admirals in the Victorian era, and he made some interesting observations about his stay here in um, Alexandria. Um, I should point out that prior to the war, 
prior to the declaration of war against Britain in 1812, Alexandria's economy was booming. And it was primarily because of the export of flour and grain to the West Indies and also to Europe to support Britain's armies. We were a Federalist city, and we were in a state, we were also part of the District of Columbia, and that should be remembered. But in an ironic way, we were feeding uh, the British Army, and I'm sure Dr. Lambert will get into that. Um, so with that, I am going to uh, turn you over to uh, Dr. Uh, Lambert, and uh, I think you're going to find his his look at Alexandria and how it, sit, how it sat in the world, how it sat in this country, and how it, saw, how it took its place as far as the global economics of the day. Uh, very interesting. So, Dr. Lambert. Thank you very much, Bill, for that uh, splendid introduction. I have been in this town once before to uh, get a look at the lie of the land uh, to draft the paper I'm going to give this evening, uh, which is not in the book. Uh, the book uh, has, covers many things, but it covers this, I think, in less than a page, uh, because I always intended that this chapter would be in the biography of Charles Napier, uh, which is coming along quite nicely, uh, but not yet finished. I don't want to talk about the War of 1812. I want to talk about the War of 1814, because everything changes in 1814. In April, Napoleon Bonaparte abdicated. The greatest war that Europe had seen in 300 years came to an end very dramatically, very suddenly, uh, almost before anybody was ready for the war to end. This grand war had finished. And there is the German view of Napoleon going from Emperor of the World to Emperor of Elba, which is the kind of island you have in the middle of the river out here. It's really not very big. Many Americans, uh, particularly in the administration, who were rather fearing that they'd get uh, some of what their own medicine, expected a full-scale British invasion of the United States. The British would send their victorious army from the Spanish Peninsula, led by the unconquered General, the Duke of Wellington, and they would come over here and do something they hadn't been able to do in 1812 or 1813. But the British were actually far too busy rebuilding Europe. As far as they were concerned, this was a small war. It was a sideshow. It was caused by the Napoleonic Wars, and they had to get Europe put back together again as soon as possible because their national debt had ballooned and they needed to rebuild a European state system that would allow them to trade their way out of deficit. This may sound a little familiar uh, to us today. So they, they looked at sending 20,000 troops, and then they worked out they didn't have enough troop ships, they didn't have enough troops, they needed to keep control of Ireland, and above all, they needed to keep the rest of the Europeans in line so they could secure their real war aims, which were the preservation of their maritime belligerent rights, the very things the Americans have been complaining about. So they sent neither a large army nor a significant increase in naval force. Instead, a small force of British troops, around 4,000, were sent to join the fleet that was already operating very successfully in the Chesapeake Bay under Admiral Sir George Coburn. He was reinforced by Major General Robert Ross, a very successful junior commander from the Peninsula War. A similar number of troops were sent up into Canada to bolster the front and to launch uh, a preemptive strike onto Lake Champlain to block any American advance. Most of these British troops had not fought under Wellington uh, in the Peninsula. They'd actually been part of the Mediterranean garrison, but they were long service, hardened professional regulars. And they were escorted across the Atlantic by a small force of British frigates that came out to reinforce the blockade. This is Lord Castlereagh's map of the War of 1812. It tells you what the British think is important, and what is important is not America. It's getting Europe put back together again. Uh, the frigate Euryalus you will see here. Uh, this is the battle aftermath of the Battle of Trafalgar. That's Lord Collingwood's flagship, the Royal Sovereign, and Euryalus is towing her into Gibraltar after the Titanic battle that settled the fate of the world in October 1805. When she arrived in North America, the Euralis was commanded by Captain Charles Napier, seen here slightly later in life. Napier was only 28 at the time he arrived uh, on the Potomac. Uh, this is Napier in his early 40s, by now a much decorated 
he has decorations from several countries. A lot of those are Portuguese. He solved their political crisis uh, for them in the 1830s. Napier was already an, um, an outstanding exponent of amphibious warfare. He'd been at war at sea since 1796 when he joined the Navy as a boy. He'd seen continuous service with a one-year break for the brief peace of Amiens, and he'd risen to command through acts of unparalleled brilliance and daring. I'll only mention one of them because I think it's relevant to look at this man's operational track record and his style. Small island of Ponza, which is just off the coast of Naples. It was a forward observation post for the Neapolitan government and held off the British blockade of Naples. In the summer of 1813, Napier took a detachment of British troops on board his, his ship, the uh, HMS Thames, uh, he joined up with another ship, HMS Furieuse, and they waited off the island for perfect wind and weather conditions, and they then sailed in, and they parked their frigates right alongside the mole, having made a 90 degree turn in a very difficult navigation. They disembarked the troops so quickly, they took the battery before it could fire a second round, and they then chased the garrison all the way up to the hill to the watch post at the top and captured that at the point of a bayonet without a single fatal casualty. This was an astonishing feat of arms and everybody in Britain knew that this was an exceptional officer. It wasn't his first brilliant deed, uh, but it was, a, I think, an, a straw in the wind for what was going to happen here. This man knew his business. He was very good. He was very smart. He'd been a keen student of the war in America. He was very engaged with what the British Navy had had to go through, how the problems they'd had dealing with privateers and particularly uh, with the American frigates. He'd studied Captain Sir Philip Brooks' ideas on ship discipline, ship command, gunnery. So he ran his ship like Philip Brooke had run the Shannon, the ship that took the Chesapeake in only 11 minutes. This was a well-ordered ship. It was ready for battle. Napier and his squadron reached Bermuda on the 29th of July, 1814. Most people here think the war was over. He's getting here very late. And he comes under the command of Vice Admiral Sir Alexander Cochrane, who had been his commander-in-chief earlier in his career. Cochrane, a man who really didn't like Americans. They'd uh, shot his brother's head off at the Battle of Yorktown, and he had a bit of a grudge. <laughs> Cochrane had seen two of Napier's most brilliant exploits, the ones that got him made a captain back in 1807, and he knew exactly what he was getting when Napier rejoined the flag. This was an outstanding uh, officer uh, with a tremendous track record. They arrived in the Chesapeake Bay on August the 11th. Uh, Napier exchanged signals with HMS Seahorse, commanded by Captain James Alexander Gordon. Uh, there is the Chesapeake. I think you are all rather more familiar with this than I am. Uh, and there, of course, is the bit we're going to talk about tonight. Here's James Alexander Gordon, often thought to be the model for Horatio Hornblower. Uh, certainly that's been argued quite recently. A convoy of transports were then coming to anchor in company with Admiral Coburn. The British were assembling an amphibious strike force on the Chesapeake, and they were going to attack somewhere in Maryland or Virginia, or both. And Washington was wide open to the sea. Afternoon on the 14th, Napier sent his small boat out to sound ahead as the Euryalus led a squadron towards the Potomac with St. Mary's Lighthouse to the west. When you get down the Chesapeake, of course, the river is enormous, and yet it's still quite shallow. He, became, he came into contact with Admiral Sir George Coburn's flagship, HMS Albion, which had just been up the Potomac scouting for what was going to happen. And Coburn is the presiding genius of this operation, not just the attack on Washington, but also the naval attack up the Potomac. This is all his doing. You know, here we are in the presence of one of Nelson's greatest protégés, a man so brilliant that when he finished doing this, they sent him to deal with Napoleon and take him to St. Helena. On the 16th, they were sounding again when the troop convoy came in sight. These guys have crossed the Atlantic, they've stopped at Bermuda, but they haven't got off the ships. They've just picked up a bit of food and water. They've trudged their way up into the Chesapeake. It's now pretty hot and sweaty. Uh, these guys have been cramped in a ship. They've not had any exercise and they're gonna launch an attack with guys who've been on a big transatlantic sailing ship voyage. They've lost a bit of condition, and this will be an issue. Coburn had planned the whole thing. He'd got it all sorted. He'd done his work. He'd broken up the Maryland militia. He'd planned the attack. They would go up the Patuxent, and they would cross country if they got half a chance, all the way to DC. They were not going to stop 
When he arrived, Admiral Cochrane found Coburn in position with a plan, the troops arrived, and it was necessary to rub out Commodore Barney's gunboat flotilla on the Patuxent. So that was point number one. Then they would follow on if the local resistance was weak. So early on the 17th, the whole fleet upped anchor and sailed for the Patuxent. But shortly after they did, the signal flew from the flagship, the Tonant, Napier, Gordon and their squadron peeled off and headed up into the Potomac River. It was a critical part of George Coburn's strategy. It was a diversion to draw American forces away from the Washington attack. It was also a way of uh, pincering the movement, but it was also opening up a second retreat. If the British Army gets to DC and big forces come down from Maryland and the north, they can take a river road home. So this was a lifeboat maybe for, for a raiding army because 4,000 men conquering DC, that's not a lot of troops. The British have no possibility of holding the ground. They can only raid and depart. So Cochrane is, is putting plan B in place with this operation. And this is a serious operation of war. Two frigates, two standard fifth rate frigates, but he needs more offensive assets. This of course, is Sir George Coburn celebrating um, what he always considered the high watermark of his career, and you know of what I speak. <laughs> In addition to the two frigates, they also sent all of the Navy, all of the squadron's bomb vessels. Now, a bomb vessel is an unusual craft. It's a bombardment platform mounting a 13-inch and a 10-inch muzzle-loading mortar firing heavy exploding shell. And these things were the key to power projection against strong positions on shore. They were ordered up the Potomac to bombard Fort Washington or Fort Warburton, depending on which one you like to call it, uh, 10 or 12 miles below the city, with a view to destroying that fort and opening a free communication above, as well as to cover the retreat of the army should its return by the Bladensburg Road be found too hazardous. Those are Admiral Alexander Cochrane's orders. So they, they have a mission. They have to get up there, get past the fort, and open the way home. James Alexander Gordon, like Napier, a Scotsman with a very long track record of, of outstanding action. He'd lost his leg in a frigate battle. He'd fought in a very famous frigate battle in 1811 off the Adriatic island of Lissa, where Nelson's great protege, Sir William Host, trounced a French and Venetian squadron. And these two men were expert coastal warriors. They knew about operating on the shore, inshore, on land. They were amphibious as well as open ocean. The other vessels of the squadron were the bomb vessels Devastation, Etna, and Meteor. The British always called their bomb vessels after terrible things, um, <laughs> each armed with two mortars. And the fire ship sloop Erebus, which was armed with Congreve rockets. So this is a, a new development, a rocket firing warship. There was also a small sloop to carry messages up and down. The bomb vessels and the mortar vessel were armed with light cannon for their own defense. So they could defend themselves, but their main offensive armament was different. The mortar is the key weapon in this story. They could fire a 13-inch shell out to 4,000 yards, way beyond cannon range. Uh, bombs would around, carried around 200 of these shells and 140 incendiary carcasses designed to set fire to wooden buildings. And their critical weapon turned out to be not the big mortars, but they carried 5,000 one-pound shot, a bit smaller than your fist, designed to be fired 200 at a time as an anti-personnel weapon. This was really good for getting the infantry out of the way. Not very nice one-pound shot. 240 barrels of gunpowder to send all of this on its way. The rocket vessel was a real novel. Here's a bomb vessel. The bombs are behind these covers. Uh, the ship would have been fully rigged as built. They're very heavy, stout vessel designed to absorb the recoil of these very powerful weapons. Uh, the mortar weighs about 13 tons. That's a solid cast iron lump. And here is the Erebus firing rockets. It looks like she's blowing up, but in fact, she's just launching a rocket or two. And many of these weapons will be fired during this operation. So the key target is the fort. If they can get past the fort, everything else should open up. But this is not an easy task. The fort is on high ground. It should be well armed. It should be defended. <laughs> 
On the first day they sailed into the Potomac, they had charts that Coburn had made uh, that took them right up to the kettle bottoms but only right up to the Kettle Bottoms. No British ship had been through the Kettle Bottom Shoals because Coburn deliberately lured the Americans into the suspicion that the British couldn't get past them. He deliberately went there and turned round. He made it look like it was just not possible for big British warships to get up there. And of course, the American Navy never sailed fully equipped warships up to Washington Navy Yard. They all stripped them of stores, got them very light to get them over the shoals and took a long time to do it. So this was not something that the Americans had anticipated. Once they got to the Cattle Bottoms, they constantly ran aground, as you might expect. These are deep draft frigates and bomb vessels. They don't have a chart, and of course the shoals move. A very difficult operation of war. How do they get through the shoals? They row the anchor in a rowboat ahead, they drop the anchor, and they run around the capstan and literally physically haul the ship through the shoals. Um, with a crew of 300, some brawny sailor lads, they, they got through, but it was very heavy work. Required several extra tots of rum to propel them. <laughs> uh, the Royal Navy works well on a full belly uh, and an ample tot. On the 21st, as they're doing this, they have to fire shot and shell into the woods alongside the river, because if the Americans had been smart, they'd have put marksmen in the woods alongside the river and fired on the guys in the boats because you can't row an open boat with people firing at you from the banks. Uh, this wasn't done. But the British were worried about uh, this new American invention, the torpedo. Not the modern torpedo, of course, just a, an ex underwater explosive device invented by uh, Robert Fulton and used in several occasions up on the New England coast. As you can see from this British cartoon, the British were not overly impressed. Um, a lot of sound and fury, but not a great deal of uh, success. Uh, Jack Tarr is saying, blow up my hull indeed, you may kiss my uh, um, taffrail, Mr. Yankee Doodle, um, which I, he's turning the other cheek, as they say, <laughs> in, that, um, in that Christian gesture uh, so familiar uh, from the Bible. So if the Americans had a chance to block that attack, but they didn't, they didn't get any light guns down there, they didn't get enough manpower down there to try and uh, break up that movement because they really hadn't anticipated it. As late as the 24th, the squadron was warping up and then they quickly made sail. As soon as the wind comes up in the right direction, they get the boats back in, they get the sails down and they sail as far as they can. And that becomes uh, very much the, the pattern. On the 16th, there were Virginia militia in the woods, commanded by General John P. Hungerford. They'd been tracking the squadron, but they just didn't have the firepower to do anything about it. Uh, when the British saw them, they opened fire on them to drive them away from the riverbank to keep them moving. On the seventh day inside the Potomac, the squadron could see in the distance the grim red glare that marked the destruction of the public buildings of Washington. As you know, Coburn had cornered the gun American gunboats. He destroyed them. The British Army had then marched across country, defeated the Americans at Bladensburg, uh, and left their calling card. Uh, one of the speakers at today's lecture reminded us that more damage was under Washington, D.C. by the United States Navy uh, than by the British. The British burned about half a dozen public buildings uh, the American Navy burnt the entire Washington Navy Yard, which was a much bigger complex, and several warships. And so the score on that one was at least 5% of Washington was destroyed by each side. Uh, but the big burn was not the White House, which is a stone building, it was the Navy Yard, which was full of wood, timber, warships, cordage, and inflammable stuff. That was the, the fire you could see from down here on the Potomac. So the operation had failed. They hadn't reached DC in time to provide this alternative way home for the main British army. They'd warped from dawn till dusk, the crews literally hauling the ships through the mud, and they'd still not managed to do it. Two of the best captains in the Royal Navy. The next day, Napier landed under a flag of truce to visit the nearest farm on the river. The owner and his, and he quote, homely daughters. I'm not sure what homely means, but I don't think it's a compliment. Um, didn't seem unduly troubled by the presence of British ships, happily regaling the Britishers with a glass of local peach brandy, which I bet took the roof off their heads. Um, the American concluded his guests would not get beyond Maryland Point because the river was too shoal, and his only concern was to preserve his valuable slaves from the depredations of the British, who he'd been told had come to steal them. Of course, they hadn't. Uh, Napier learned nothing useful about the navigation, but he did understand that the locals really weren't very interested in fighting. Um, as far as Mr. Farmer was concerned, if he could keep his, his personal possessions, he was quite happy. 
By the 22nd, Navy Secretary William Jones in Washington knew that Gordon's squadron had passed the Kettle Bottoms, but he still didn't know what it was going to do, or whether there was an, another army force on board that ship force. What was going to happen? Where were they going? It was uncertain. Anxious to reinforce Fort Washington, Jones urged General Winder, the highly unsuccessful general at Bladensburg, to release the sailors and marines that were with his army to reinforce the garrison. Winder, nervous that his force was far too weak to face any British uh, forces without the sailors, the only people who fought well at Bladensburg, it has to be said, refused. So the fort was left as it was. On the same day, a deputation from Alexandria attended Admiral Coburn in Washington and attempted to surrender. This was very wise, but Coburn, who had no men to spare to occupy the town, waved them away. He, um, you know, be off with you. you know, I, I can't take your surrender because I can't come over to your town. Uh, he'd, already, he'd taken a town, he didn't need any more. On the 25th, squadron weighed anchor and began to warp up Maryland Reach. Uh, around one o'clock, everything went very badly wrong. As the Euryalus' lock records, I quote, before the ship came head to wind and the sails rolled up, the squall came on so furious, prevented the sails being handed and sprung the mizzenmast, brought up by both anchors and got sails furled. Uh, that's on James Alexander Gordon's ship. Napier also noticed the sky suddenly darken and he knew enough of the local climate to anticipate the storm. He had the Togallant's mainsail, jib and spanker taken in, but he'd underestimated the elemental fury of what was going to happen. A tremendous squall burst in the area, driving a wall of water into the Euryalus and knocking overboard large parts of her rigging. The bowsprit being relieved, it had been blown out of place, sank back in its place, but broke completely through. So he'd lost all three of his top masts, he'd lost the bowsprit, uh, he'd lost other key parts of his rigging. The ship was effectively dismasted and a wreck. This tight, well-organized frigate had been reduced to an immobile wreck by a single piece of natural intervention. Nap Napier, unbelievably calm under all circumstances throughout his life, met the disaster with his accustomed quickness of mind and common sense. With the squall now hurtling further down the river, he sent his men to dinner because he knew they'd been working all day and they'd work better on a full stomach uh, with a tot of rum. They weren't in danger of sinking, they just left it. They just left the whole thing, a wreck. Went to dinner and after dinner they set to with a will. He reported to, to Gordon, who thought they'd have to go back because the Euryalus could not be repaired, that he would be ready when the last of the bomb vessels came up to the position where he was anchored. And he was as good as his word. They got the ship re mended, re-rigged, and ready to sail just as the last bomb vessel came up. He was absolutely spot on. Just before dawn on the 26th, they got up the top mast, got the old bowsprit overboard and chopped up. Uh, jury bowsprit in a position and rigged. By dinner time, Euryalus was ready to proceed and she proceeded exactly as Napier had promised. As it was a flat calm, Napier had his Royal Marines out in the ship's boats towing and they moved another four miles up the river while the ship's sailors finished tightening down the rigging. So the Marines were pulling, because Marines don't know much about rigging, and the sailors were getting the rigging in order. It was a brilliant piece uh, of response. A disaster had occurred, he'd, re he'd met it, and he'd overcome it. On the 27th, there was a fair wind, which must have been a great relief, because everybody was beat by then. And working up for two hours, the squadron anchored around seven o'clock in the morning and sounded the channel at Indian Head before sailing past. Around five in the afternoon, Napier could see Mount Vernon in a commanding position there we are. On the Virginia shore, at a point where the river narrows. And like any good British liberal, he had the ship's band play Washington's March in honor of the general who taught the British a great deal about democracy and politics. Um, had he been a Tory like Coburn, he might have landed and burnt the place. Uh, but you were very lucky he was a liberal. Otherwise, you'd have one less local landmark. <coughs> Royal Navy was very divided politically, although they were all on the same team when it came to fighting the enemy. The f shortly after that, uh, the prospect of Fort Washington opened ahead of them, uh, and they could see that it occupied a commanding position on elevated ground. Indeed, Washington himself had picked out the location and said, if well supported, it could defy all the navies of Europe to pass the place. A small star-shaped earthwork and a river-level battery had been built to deal with an enemy coming up river. If hostile ships could pass the fort, it would be defenseless. It needed some support. It needed some block ships, some gunboats, needed some troops. It needed to be well held. 
but it was a very strong position if held. It could have been truly formidable. But that day, Captain Samuel Dyson had a garrison of 49 men. He'd only arrived in the fort a week before, and his calls for additional heavy guns and more troops had been completely ignored by the government in Washington. Well, not in Washington. They were sort of wandering around not being in Washington because Washington <laughs> was not a good place to be. Um, General Dyson, uh, uh, Captain Dyson had asked General Winder for patrols. He'd asked for information. He'd asked for all kinds of things, and he'd received nothing. Nobody had told him anything. He thought that Ross's army was coming through the back door, the Royal Navy was coming up through the front door, and he didn't really think this was a good place for him and his 49 men to be. So he wasn't probably in the right state of mind to fight a furious rearguard action. Judging they had the firepower to subdue the fort, Gordon and Napier moved closer and anchored around 6.30 in the evening, a little below the fort, just as the sun's about to set. Gordon positioned the bomb vessels just beyond gun range so they could bombard the fort. His next plan was to move the frigates in to attack the fort while a powerful landing force went round the back and stormed the position from the back. This was standard Mediterranean fleet drill. This is how you take a defended battery in the Mediterranean. And it would have worked perfectly well. They then fired a ranging shot from one of the mortar vessels. The, the bomb was accurate. It landed in the fort. Shortly afterwards, as Sailing Master John Davis of the Euryalus reported, I quote, at about 7.15, the fort blew up. Uh, Gordon could see the garrison abandoning their position and marching inland, and then a massive explosion destroyed the fort, I quote, leaving the capital of America and the populous town of Alexandria open to the squadron without the loss of a man. Dyson had panicked. He had no information, he had no knowledge, he faced a powerful enemy who seemed determined to attack and he decided not to try the experiment of defending the position. He took his men and left. He blew up the, war the fort and he crossed the river and he carried on until he was four miles north of Washington. He didn't stop anywhere until he was well out of harm's way. The lack of information, I think, is critical. The sounds of gunfire and the thunderous explosion of the fort and the magazine were heard in Washington where Commodore Thomas Tenji was trying to restore some kind of order to the devastated Navy Yard and it obviously seemed the Brits were coming back for round two. Uh, everybody else was a bit worried as well. Poor old Dyson, he probably did the best thing he could under the circumstances, but the administration needed a scapegoat, so he was court-martialed and cashiered uh, for destroying government property. Thomas Tingey, who'd burnt the whole Navy Yard, wasn't, but he had orders from a superior, so that was okay. Um, but the destruction of Fort Washington, and. Here's a 1937 view, which I think really gives you the point. It's not very wide there. Uh, you're on high ground. The, the gun battery, I think, is down here uh, at the time. It's a tremendous position, and if well held and properly fortified, but it wasn't. At first light on the 28th, the squadron shifted anchor to a position close under the fort. They sent landing parties to complete what the Americans had started, mostly by knocking the trunnions off the cannon and chucking them in the river so they couldn't be used on the way back. Nobody wants to be fired on by the same set of guns twice. One man deserted. He was a Swede. He decided to become an American. <laughs> Took them two hours to do that. The Americans, of course, had plenty of men in the area. They just didn't have any command and control to bring them into the right position to do the right thing. Everybody was running around really like a headless chicken. Uh, the only people who knew what they were doing were the two Scots captains, and they had a very clear idea of what they were about. They were going to make a lot of money. <laughs> Never underestimate the enthusiasm of Scottish officers for a bit of swag. <laughs> the problem facing Alexandria was uh, quite serious. The Alexandria militia had been called out, and they were wandering around somewhere in Maryland because General Winder hadn't told them what to do either. They weren't at Bladensburg, but they weren't in Alexandria either. And Winder had even commandeered the town's own bought and paid for a pair of 12-pounders. So there were no guns, no troops, nothing. In effect, the delay of passing the Kettle Bottoms reversed Coburn's original plan. Instead of Napier and Gordon opening the way for the army, the army had opened the way for Napier and Gordon. So the whole thing had now turned on its head. This was now the main attack, because the other attack had finished. While the threat of American bayonets halted the slide into panic in Washington and persuaded the good men of Georgetown not to follow Alexandria's example and surrender, uh, bayonets would not recover command of the river. 
And having burnt the bridge, they weren't going to get any troops across the river very quickly either. So here's the waterfront of Alexandria. That's the only one I can find. I, sus I suspect you've all seen this one. But uh, I might have to give this lecture to people who have not been to Alexandria, so I thought I'd better <laughs> show them what it looks like. In the aftermath of the explosion, the mayor of Alexandria, Charles Sims, and other civic worthies went down the river to negotiate with James Gordon. Well, they just went down to surrender, actually, because they didn't have a negotiating position. Gordon refused to take their surrender because he couldn't see the town, and he issued them a stern warning not to resist, and he sent his men behind them to buoy the channel so they could get up that bit quicker. He was only going to summon the town to surrender when he had them under his guns, quite literally. He was going to park on the waterfront, get his gun ports up and run the guns out and say, now what are your terms? 9 p.m. they anchored for the night two miles below Alexandria and they could already see several vessels dismantled. Basically, most of the ship captains had stripped their ships out and scuttled them because they hoped, thought the British would just sort of leave them there. They'd underestimated the Scotsman again. The city, uh, as Bill told you earlier, had done very well out of the relationship between the Federalists and the British. But the war had been very bad for business. It was not possible to get stuff out of the Chesapeake from 1813 onwards. So heavy cargoes of, of tobacco and grain uh, and flour were just not moving. So things were clogging up here. This was becoming a place full of stuff and uh, empty of money uh, and proceeds. Uh, at 4 a.m. on the 29th, the squadron began warping up to the town, again hauling on the anchors. They set sail at 1040 and they anchored off the wharves shortly after noon. James Gordon made the burghers of Alexandria an offer they simply could not refuse. They were 200 yards off the waterfront, broadsides directed. In return for an undertaking not to make a nuisance of themselves, uh, that is the good burghers, the British promised not to damage private property or molest the inhabitants. That's exactly what you want if you're the mayor. You know, these guys are gonna be in the town, but they're not gonna do any damage. They're, they're nice enemies. <laughs> In return, the town would deliver up all naval and military stores, all ships, including those recently scuttled in the river, which were to be weighed up by the locals, and all of their cargoes were to be reloaded, again, by the locals. The British would pay in cash for any food they required, and they took delivery of several hundred pounds of beef while they were here. In fact, they left the last consignment on the jetty as they left. But they paid in, in good government British bonds. So it was good business having the British in town. A lot of hungry sailors, and I bet the bars did a roaring trade. There's nothing like a, a bar for a thirsty sailor. I think a lot of people in Alexandria probably quite liked having 600 thirsty Brits in town. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, the council having surrendered needed to cover their tails with, with the guys back in Washington, so they explained it was force majeure. They'd been left defenseless. They had no troops, they had no guns, the British had arrived. What could they do? Uh, the forts erected for the defense of the district having been blown up by our own men and abandoned without resistance, and the town of Alexandria having been left without troops or any means of defense against the hostile forces now within sight. We surrendered. That's, that's a quote. Yeah. That's exactly what the point they're making. This is a Federalist town. They don't approve of Mr. Madison's war, uh, and they're not going to fight and die for it because that's not in their best interest. They just want the war to stop and the business to resume because business is good. And to make sure nobody interfered with this treaty they'd made, they sent the news off to General Winder, who was still nominally in command of the 10th District, and Generals Robert Young, commanding the Alexandria Militia, and John P. Hungerford of the Virginia Militia, requesting strict adherence to the agreed terms. Basically, don't come in town and cause any problems. We don't want a battle in the town. That's the last thing we want. The whole transaction was remarkably civilized. Very rich target. After the destruction of Washington, it was by far the richest target in the area, so very attractive. And the locals stood to lose their homes, their fortunes, everything. So cooperate. It will be far less painful. And of course, the people of Alexandria had seen Washington captured and destroyed, quite literally. So why would they resist? If the national capital can't be defended, there's no hope for them. Both sides adhered to the terms of the settlement, uh, pretty much to the letter. Uh, the British did agree that they would haul the ships up that had been sunk because the locals seemed rather squeamish about doing this, and the British were much better at it anyway. Uh, they spent three days weighing up sunken ships, refitting them, loading them from the riverside warehouses while Royal Marines patrolled the streets. They also bought 2,000 pounds of fresh beef, um, and the whole thing, very tight operation. Mayor Charles Sims reported, I quote, it is impossible that men could be have behaved better than the British behaved while the town was in their power. 
There's an endorsement. The Royal Navy, the best behaved visitors you've ever had in town. <laughs> By contrast, in Richmond, the Republican-leaning inquirer, I quote, thank God that this degraded town no longer forms part of the state of Virginia. Of course, <laughs> being part of DC allowed them to shuffle off that plane. Um, September the 1st, the Republican editorial in the National Enquirer lamented, and I quote, the degrading terms dictated by the commander of the British squadron below Alexandria to the civil authority of that town, connected with the offer of the townsmen before the squadron had even reached the fort to surrender without resistance, and their singular mission to Admiral Coburn while he was in this city have excited everywhere astonishment and indignation. No, only in Republican America, not in Federalist America, where nobody thought that was... Uh, uh, any serious problem. Indignation is cheap. The Americans had no power, so all it could be was indignant. Um, the British didn't even notice, but they were reading the newspapers, and the Americans published everything. Th there was no discretion. Everything was in the newspapers. The good stuff, the bad stuff, the secret stuff, any stuff. <laughs> and, and the great thing about fighting the Americans is they write in some kind of English, so it's, it's really easy to understand. <laughs> You know, after, after 20 years fighting the French, you write in some strange other language. This was really, really simple stuff. You know, your intel officer needed no language skills. You could even talk to the locals one-to-one. -one. It was very, very easy. A force of Virginia militia approached the town, and the council urged them to respect the treaty, and the commanding officers then received fresh orders from Washington to camp on the high ground outside the town, which I think is probably about here. So the Virginia militia were up here watching, but they didn't go downtown. They didn't go down King Street and, you know, Join the Brits in the pub. <laughs> the British gather the spoils of war. The American government, eight miles away, is desperately trying to recover some shreds of credibility. And they decide that defeating the tiny British force and stopping it getting back down the river uh, will, here's the 1860s, and there, of course, is King Street, and there up on the hill is, that's where we are, I guess. Uh, so defeating the British and stopping them getting out, that would restore credibility. That would make the government look big and strong. And so Secretary of the Navy sends Captain John Ord Creighton to consult Commodore John Rogers, the senior officer of the US Navy, on the best method of preventing the British from retreating. Rogers relied on the British cupidity, avarice, greed. For They'd, they'd hang around a while, filling their holes and really getting the plunder to make some money. So he would build batteries. He would have furnaces for red-hot shot. Dangerous stuff, that. Problem is, British control the river. And the gun you need to stop a British frigate going down the river is a 32-pounder, and it weighs six tons. You cannot move that on a dirt road. You need water transport. You don't control the river. And you don't have any 32-pounders anywhere near the river anyway. So Roger's problem is he can see the solution, but he doesn't have the assets to apply it, certainly not in the short term. Jones was determined to destroy the invaders, and he ordered Rogers to bring 650 picked men from nearby Baltimore and prepare to attack the British with boats. David Dixon, David Porter turned up as well. Washington Jones sent him to the White House on the west bank of the Potomac to emplace a battery of 18-pounders and a furnace, uh, in position picked by James Monroe, now the acting secretary for war. And Rogers, he suggested, should reoccupy Fort Washington, while Captain Oliver Hazard Perry set up another battery across the river to set up a crossfire. The British were going to be caught in a vice. All America's naval heroes would be there. With a lot of naval personnel, they would stop the British. The army, hopeless. Navy, they could do it. Easy. The local press was already celebrating the victory, a bit like they did when the Chesapeake sailed out to fight the Shannon. That kind of pre-battle pre victory celebration. Slightly embarrassing in the event. It is impossible, declared one exultant newspaper, that the ships can pass such formidable batteries as ours, commanded by our naval heroes and manned by our invincible seamen. We'll teach them how to draw up terms of capitulation. On the 30th of August, John Davis observed several guns to be fired at the guard boat up the river, while camps of troops could be seen on the north side of the river and behind the town. Even so, the British just carried on. They were loading the prizes, and the sailors, as well as the officers, could count the value of the swag as it went into the ships. The sweated labor of British sailors was in their own interest because the prize money would be divvied up. They'd all get a cut. And if they took enough stuff, they would get to be very rich. And those two Scotsmen weren't going to leave empty-handed. They were going to do the full thing. <laughs> Gordon was ready to send some of his prizes down the river, escorted by the bomb vessel Meteor. Uh, but early on the first, Meteor signaled to Gordon that HMS Ferry was coming up the river. Um, she might have been called a ferry, but she was quite well-armed warship. Um, Cochrane's orders of the 27th were to return. The operation against Washington was over, and he had other plans, which if you live in Baltimore, you'll be familiar with. There was no need for Gordon to wait for the army. They'd gone home. 
And it was probably high time he left, because now the Americans had only one target to concentrate on. And local newspapers confirmed that this was uh, about to happen. Cochrane had not expected his subordinates to turn this diversion into a major operation of war, but of course they had. Baker, the captain of the ferry, reported that troops and batteries were assembling. It would be no picnic going home, but at least they'd have the current behind them, and they knew uh, the river rather better. On the first, as a party from Euryalus were attempting to heave up a half-sunken ship, the British had their first intimation of trouble. John Davis, the master of the ship, noted, I quote, a party of the enemy's cavalry came into town. In truth, they were not cavalry, there were only three of them, and they were naval officers uh, rather than army officers. Uh, one of them grabbed Napier's midshipman, David Fraser, who was ashore superintending loading the prizes, by his neckcloth and hauled him over the pommel of his horse. Midshipmen, quite small people, so he picked him up. <laughs> Um, the kidnappers then galloped off, but fortunately for all concerned, Fraser's neckcloth was obviously cheap and rather badly made because it split and he got away. <laughs> he ran back towards his boat crew who picked their weapons up and, and fronted up and the Americans thought better of this. The bold horsemen were in fact Captain David Porter, USN, whose new ship, the USS Essex, had just been destroyed in Washington Navy Yard. That was the second Essex he'd had destroyed in a single year. Uh, the other ship destroyed in the fire, the USS Argus, and her prospective commander, Captain Creighton, was the man who'd grabbed Fraser. And the third uh, man was a midshipman. Uh, Port Porter was fortunate to get away with this. He was an undischarged parole. That was, he was, had not yet to be exchanged as a prisoner of war by the British, therefore he was in violation of his parole. And he was in civilian clothes. He could have been shot had he been arrested. I think the British would just have made, made something embarrassing out of him. Uh, Mayor Charles Sims was furious. Um, so was Charlie Napier. Uh, just as Sims was trying to explain this by writing a letter to James Alexander Gordon, Napier burst into his room with the injured midshipman in tow, as in, look what, they, look what they've done. Uh, and I quote, with the strongest expressions of rage in his countenance. It's likely Sims had a hard job understanding what Charlie was saying, because the more angry he got, the thicker his Scots accent became. And I suspect he dropped back into some Scots vernacular to express his, his rage. Sims fortunately explained that it was not anything local, that it was some idiots from the US Navy had done this and uh, they really shouldn't. You know. <laughs> By the time the thing was settled, the British ships had got their gun ports open again and, and they would beat to quarters. They, you know, they were ready for anything, uh, but it all then calmed down. Porter went back to his proper job building a battery at the White House and Gordon began to send his vessels down the river that night. This was going to be difficult. They had 21 captured merchant ships, an American gunboat, uh, and all of their own vessels to get down the river. And they had, of course, only their, the ship's companies to man the prize vessels. They had 16,000 pounds of flour, 1,000 hogsheads of tobacco, 150 bales of cotton, along with wine, sugar, and sundry other goods. This sounds very exciting. Gordon may have been in a hurry, but they didn't leave without cramming every last space in the holds of all of the ships, merchant and warships, uh, to the utmost degree. Napier regretted bitterly leaving 200,000 barrels of flour behind. Greedy fellow. Both men knew their crews would need all their enthusiasm for the task ahead. They were going to have to fight their way down, and at the moment the wind was dead foul, and first the Euryalus and then devastation ran hard aground uh, as they beat down river. So it was going to be difficult. At 5 a.m. on the 3rd, the squadron finally weighed and began warping down the river. Uh, thunder and lightning appeared likely. Devastation then grounded. Three small boats came down to attack. They were fire ships sent by Commodore Rogers. Devastation beat them off and the boats were driven into the river and it expended. John Rogers then landed in Alexandria and got his guns out and forced the town mayor to hold the American flag back up. Uh, the town mayor didn't want to hold the flag up until the Brits were around the bend and well out of sight. Uh, <laughs> he was actually more concerned about the British than he was about John Rogers, uh, which is, I think, quite illustrative. Next morning on the 4th, uh, Napier opened fire on some troops ashore that were coming in range of his boats, and he could hear heavy firing from the direction of Fort Washington. The Americans were back in the position. It was very wise they'd broken up those guns. The enemy's batteries were coming into action and the squadron was having difficulty coordinating because ships were running aground and having to be hauled off the river bank uh, consistently. 
As they came close to the White House, the White House battery, both Etna and Meteor were set alight by incendiary projectiles uh, from the shore battery before a well-placed shell from Meteor destroyed the furnace. Something like a bomb to make your day go well. The White House, another def excellent defensive position pointed out by George Washington, who was clearly very worried about the British coming up the river and doing a bit of raiding, had been quite well armed. But Porter, never averse to a little bit of pointless bombast, hoisted a large flag over the battery saying, free trade and sailors' rights. It was the same flag he'd flown over the USS Essex when he'd lost it at Valparaiso earlier that year. But to his credit, he fought the battle with considerable skill. He moved his artillery around, kept his men mostly uh, under cover. But the British, again, had a solution. They waited for the wind to be in their favor. Uh, they then sailed down and put the two frigates right alongside the battery, kept their heads down while all of the prizes and the bomb vessels went past, lobbed a few shells in, and then anchored up when they were out of range. It was a very neat piece of work. They weren't going to capture the battery. They weren't going to land. They just wanted the, the Americans to get their heads down uh, so they could get past. Ten British casualties, mostly musketry, which tells you how close they were to the Maryland shore. Close enough for a musket, no more than 100 paces. And at that range, uh, cannon fire is pretty savage. Uh, that evening, Porter got his 32-pounder cannon he needed, but it was too late. The British had gone. Uh, so they'd outpaced the reinforcements. So on the 5th, suppressed the defenders' fire. And Napier and Gordon very cleverly shifted the, hot, the, the, the cargo in the hold of the ships so that they were heeled over to an angle so they could fire up into the, into the woods and the hills to clear the Americans out of their position. The Americans hadn't anticipated this. Again, something that a Mediterranean officer would know, uh, but somebody who'd not been in the Mediterranean wouldn't. British gunnery was exceptionally good. Seahorses First Lieutenant Henry King directed the first two guns and knocked out two American pieces uh, with the opening rounds. Napier observed the Americans behaved remarkably well, uh, but they couldn't stop the British passing. Uh, Porter was expecting a landing, doesn't happen. They drove the Americans out of their works and sailed past uh, with some loss. Uh, more to the Americans than to the British. Uh, towards the end of the action, Napier was hit in the neck by a rifle ball fired almost certainly by a Virginia militiaman from Jefferson County. I can't remember how I know this, but apparently they were American riflemen from Jefferson County, and it was a rifle ball. He was saved from serious injury by the thick collar of his, of his coat. But while the captain of the fleet later brushed it off as a minor thing, and Napier was, was, con remained in action, for the rest of his life, his head hung to one side. Uh, it certainly done some damage to one of the vertebrae, and his neck was tilted. Uh, permanently to one side. Uh, that was his third serious injury uh, in the Napoleonic era. Once the frigates had sailed past, David Porter gallantly sent a torpedo after them. This one had been personally made by Robert Fulton, but it exploded harmlessly. Uh, in the evening, the convoy approached Oliver Hazard Perry's battery at Indian Head, uh, but despite Porter's heroics, Perry simply hadn't had enough time to get more than one serious gun into position. So, the British essentially do the same thing. They get a ship which is run aground off the shore. They then get the frigates in position to suppress the enemy's fire. And late in the evening, they run past the battery after dark. Erebus, the ship that had been afloat, that had been aground, is got off, firing salvos of rockets, which at night must have been quite impressive. Salvos of Congreve rockets. Two, two British sailors on Euralis were killed and were buried in the river. Three wounded men uh, would linger, but they too would die shortly afterwards. As they approached the Kettle Bottoms, the next day the bigger ships unloaded some cargo into the smaller prizes. Uh, but even so, they managed to get aground several times. But by now, the Americans were no longer harassing them, and they were able to get on their way. On the 8th, the frigate HMS Havana sent a boat up to Gordon, and at 1300 that day, uh, they anchored up in the in the Kettle Bottoms. They rejoined the flag on the 11th, leaving the Potomac. Once the Potomac squadron rejoined, Cochrane's flag captain, Sir Edward Codrington, had an opportunity to discuss the raid with Gordon and Napier. Codrington's a brilliant officer. He, his performance at Trafalgar was probably the most uh, sophisticated of any captain on that day. I quote, they overcame difficulties which could have dismayed many men in either of the two professions. And they brought out 21 prizes, many of which they weighed, corked, and mastered, as well as loaded, and then forced their way through the most difficult shoal navigation in spite of batteries erected to stop them and a vast number of troops firing down on their decks in their narrow parts. 
The frigates were even obliged to take their guns out on account of getting aground and put them in again. In short, it is nothing less brilliant than the capture of Washington, and those employ deserve laurel crowns. Cochrane agreed. The operation had, and I quote, exceeded my most sanguine expectations. In an operation lasting 23 days, the British squadron had pushed up to the head of the navigation, destroyed a significant fortress, seized a major town, taken an extensive haul of prizes, and returned with minimal loss, despite the best efforts of a thoroughly armed American government. William James, the preeminent naval historian of this war, a contemporary of it, and British, as you'll probably gather from what he had to say, reckoned that this, of all the great operations of the long wars from 1793 to 1815, was the finest coastal operation of the era, and, and I quote, the most brilliant of the many detached operations of the American war. Gordon's reward would be a detached command in the Gulf of Mexico, where he hoped to make yet more prize money. Uh, Napier went off to fire those rockets that are in the national anthem that you sing. Um, they, he literally fired those rockets. Um, he was the, in command of the, the squadron that went up the ferry branch of the Patapsco uh, on the last night of that operation. Gordon recorded, and I quote, to Captain Napier, I owe more obligations than I have words to express, stressing the remarkable refit of the Euryalus after the, after the tornado on the 25th. Napier knew the success of the operation reflected at the outstanding skill of every officer and man in the squadron. It wasn't two clever captains. It was an astonishingly good professional team. Some have argued that the Potomac raid actually delayed the attack on Baltimore and thereby aided the Americans. In truth, it diverted American naval and militia forces and particularly vital heavy artillery, which could never make it back from the Potomac to Baltimore at anything like the pace uh, that the British were able to move. Rogers, Porter and Perry, along with scarce seamen, did manage to get back, but the heavy guns didn't. In responding to a relatively minor raid by a highly mobile British amphibious strike force, the Americans put their resources in a less important place. Two days after they cleared Point Lookout, Gordon and Napier would be in action off Baltimore and the British troops would land at North Point. Fifteen years later, Napier requested a testimonial. And here is the famous uh, William Charles cartoon, which I think is just brilliant. Look how the hair is standing up on end. And this classical Minotaur is the ultimate emblem of British sea power, Jack Tarr as Minotaur. Wonderful picture. Fifteen years later, Napier requested a testimonial of his services from Admiral Cochrane. And here's the Baltimore one, in which uh, the Minotaurs are being driven away. Uh, it didn't happen like that. The Americans did not drive the Americans, uh, did not drive the British back to their boats at Baltimore. The British left of their own accord because there were not enough of them to capture the city. It certainly wasn't like that. And here is Charlie in his prime at 18, in 1840, capturing the Palestinian fortress of Sidon from the Egyptians. But 10 years before that, he'd requested this testimonial from Alexander Cochrane, his old, his old admiral, the man who'd made him a captain and had commanded him in this campaign. Sir Alexander was happy to oblige. I quote, when on the coast of America, you commanded one of the frigates sent up the Potomac to Alexandria to draw off the attention of the enemy while the army was advancing against Washington. Sir James Golden, who commanded the detachment, spoke in the highest terms of your conduct, as well as that of the other officers under his command. And the service performed on that occasion is well known at the Admiralty. I think you were wounded in the neck when on that service. Indeed, he was. Napier went on to have the most astonishing career. He would be a mercenary in the Portuguese Civil War of 1833-4, which he settled in a single afternoon in a brilliant naval battle. He then became a general in the Portuguese Civil War and also helped to finish the, that. He then was the major reform figure in the Royal Navy, leading to the improvement of professional conditions for seamen and for warrant officers. He was the first man to build and operate iron-hulled steam-powered vessels, uh, spending his prize money on a steamboat service on the River Seine, which are captured in art by J.M.W. Turner, the, art the artist of Britishness, as the conquest of France. He said, Waterloo is nothing. The plan was that the British Army would storm the American positions and the Royal Navy would, would attack at the same time. Uh, the Royal Navy set off as directed and the British Army decided to stop for breakfast. And by the time they'd finished <laughs> breakfast, you know, um, MacDonough did a very good thing. He realized he couldn't fight the British on the lake, so he just moored up close in shore and said, come and get me. Um, if the British Army had done their job, they'd have turned him out of that position and he would have been beaten. Uh, but the British weren't going to invade New York. They, were just, they just wanted to control the lake to make sure the Americans didn't go up to, to Montreal and Quebec. So it was, a, it was cutting off an American assault line. It wasn't they weren't going to do Saratoga again. They'd learned their lesson. Uh, 
you know, the Brits are slow, but they're not that slow. <laughs> you know, you know. Once, once you get off the main waterway, you can't win in America. There are too many of them, uh, and they're quite hostile, so you don't do that. You stick to the bits you control. The water lines of communication is the only thing the Brits are going to go for in this war, because they have no manpower. You know, even raising the colonial marines, uh, you know, the, the local enslaved people who ran away and joined the British, uh, they just, they never had enough manpower to be, to be a serious player once they were outside the reach of their ship's guns. So British power is where the cannon can reach, which is about a mile and a half from the ship. So that's Britain's war against America. Anything further than that, they're taking a chance, as they did at Washington. Yeah, thank you for that. The, you know, was, was the raid on Washington and Alexandria a retaliation for the, the American destruction of what is now Toronto? Many, many Canadians rather wish you'd go back and do it again, because it's a, I think it's a rather ugly town. Um, it's my, it's my, I know most of Canada quite well, and it's my least favourite Canadian town by a country mile. Um, it only became so in November 1814 when somebody asked a question in the House of Commons as to why we'd torched the public buildings of Washington. And the, the government minister couldn't think of anything better to say, so he said that. That wasn't why they did it. Um, the real reason was to try and get the American army off the Canadian border to come down and defend Washington. Um, the American army had invaded Canada in 1812, 1813, 1814, and the last thing the British wanted was them to carry on doing this. So by attacking them down south, they hoped that the American army would have to turn around and, and come south. The fact there had been some outrages on the, on the Canadian frontier, um, the town of Newark was much more badly treated uh, than York. You know, they, they burned the house in the middle of the town in the middle of winter and, and drove the people out into the snow. You know, that was really, really very barbaric. So there, there were things happening up there, but as the war went on, opinions hardened and people's attitudes change. What started off as a, a slightly apologetic war, by the end, you know, it had started to become really quite unpleasant. Um, and certain sectional interests on both sides had a, had a rationale for this. But no, it, it, it certainly wasn't done for that reason. Uh, but it was a very nice label when the Americans say, oh, it's barbaric, you can't do that. Well, you started it. Which goes for the war, really. You know, we didn't start it. We had far bigger things to do in Europe than, uh, than fight America. Um, the war starts with the invasion of Florida, which belonged to the Spanish, and then Canada, which sort of belonged to us. Of course, Canada wasn't a country then. It was called British North America. It's part of the British Empire. So don't let the Canadians tell you they won the War of 1812 because they didn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> Canada becomes a country in 1867. Had Napier been Would would the situation be different if Napier had been on the American team? Uh, yes, um, Napier had been at war for 20 years. There was simply nothing he didn't know about the business in hand. And his, his track record is so extraordinary that it's, it's highly unlikely he would have failed to come up with something. Um, somebody asked me the other day, you know, how do the American naval officers rank up against the British? Well, a couple of them would have been in the top 20 or 30 British frigate captains, so good. But the British had people at the very top who were battle-hardened combat veterans, and there's simply no substitute for experience. Uh, there's nobody in this war who's as brilliant as Philip Brooke, ship-to-ship -ship combat, nobody. Um, and Henry Hope, who commanded the Endymion when she took the USS President, probably the finest action between two ships under full sail uh, ever fought. Astonishingly clever men. And these were, these were veterans. They'd spent their whole lives doing this. So as good as the American officers were, they just didn't have the background and the training to match up to. When the British sent their first 11 over here, early 1813 and then again in 1814, instead of sending the third 11, they sent the, the best guys. A bit like the cricket match. If we'd send the proper England cricket team, you wouldn't have won. <laughs> um, you know, any, you know, but scratch team, yeah. You know, the guy, in, in 1812, the British squadron on the North American station was made up of ships that weren't fit to fight the French and officers who weren't good enough to fight the French. And by 1814, the people who'd been dealing with the French were over here and everything changed. They came over in numbers, but more importantly, they came over with quality. The British didn't send too many ships over here. Remember this idea that it's the war between Britain and America. About 
seven, seven and a half percent of the Royal Navy was over here. About seven percent of the British Army was over here. So it wasn't Britain and America having a war, it was the Americans fighting a little bit of Britain uh, while the rest of the British were fighting everybody else. So it was, you know, it was we were sort of doing it with one hand behind our back, um, fending off what was happening here until the war in Europe finishes and then, you know, 4,000 troops, maybe 8,000 troops, it's nothing. Um, very small naval reinforcement. We just, we just want the war to go away. Uh, British war aims in this war, just go away and behave yourselves. You know, at no stage did the British want anything that, apart from peace and quiet to get on with what they were doing. So it's, it, that's what the war is ultimately about for the British. And so the peace is status quo ante. At the back. In the War of 1812, uh, we've just had a very good two-day uh, seminar on this, and I think it's, it's quite clear that uh, despite those attempts to prove that the Americans really just wanted to get a bit of respect on the street from the, the big boys, um, Canada, Florida, you know, those are the things that really motivate people. Different parts of the United States have different views. Uh, the Federalists just want to do more business, they don't want to fight a war. But the Republicans out west, they want to clear the Indians out, they want to get more territory, and they don't want the Brits up there interfering with the Indians and supporting their attempts to hold their territory. Guys down south want more land, plant more cotton on because they're using up the land they've already got, so there's, a, there's an expansionist movement down there. You know, what's the Battle of New Orleans about? It, it's about the extension of plantation slavery. You know, what does Andrew Jackson's army do the day after the battle? They round up the escaped slaves. They don't chase the British back to their boats. You know, they're rounding up their property. That's, that's what it's, and that's why they put that big statue in the square. You've seen the statue in the square in New Orleans, Andrew Jackson on his horse. It's just like the one uh, in DC. And during the Union occupation in the Civil War, they put, he preserved the Union, <laughs> just to annoy the locals. So American war aims are expansionist. And if you don't think they were, why did they invade Mexico in 1846? What were they after? You know, the United States is a, is a land power and it's concerned with more land. Britain is a sea power and it's concerned with controlling the seas. The British have no capacity to rule large amounts of land. That's the lesson of the American War of Independence. You know, we don't have the manpower to do this, so let's do the other thing. If we control the seas, then we can keep what we're doing safe. That's what Britain is fighting for, the preservation of her maritime belligerent rights, the ability to blockade, to arrest neutral ships, to impress sailors, all that stuff the Americans complained about, that is British strategy. That is the, the basis of British power. If you take that away, Britain is a tiny little, weak, indefensible island off the north coast of Europe that can't even grow enough food to feed its own population. So if we give that up, we're toast. So attacking us to make us give that up with no real army and a pretty small navy, you're asking for trouble. British would have fought till the end of time to preserve those rights. They wouldn't let the Americans talk about them at Ghent, and they wouldn't let the Europeans talk about them at Vienna either. That's the deal. That's off the table. Anything else we can talk about, but not that. And for the next hundred years, the British rule the world because they have the power to break anybody's economy. How's the war end over here? America's bankrupt. Maritime belligerent rights allow you to bankrupt your enemy. Napoleon was bankrupt. The Russians were bankrupt. That's why they fought Napoleon. The Americans were bankrupt. That's British strategy. Burning a bit of Washington was most unusual. We very rarely got to the enemy's capital city, but we did get in their bank and take all their money. No money, no war. Over there. So I'm going to start, I'm going to sound like Peter Pennington for a moment. Ooh. Ooh. You'll need to change the diction a little, but otherwise... <laughs> Question of. 
their objective was to destroy, and they failed. Not to annoy. <laughs> <laughs> At the end of the war, Napier comes back from. Uh, I haven't had a chance to read that, but I will. Don't worry. At the end of the war, Napier comes back from Bermuda, where he's refitted his ship, and he's blockading inside the Chesapeake. It's early January. It's miserable weather. It's blowing a gale. It's pretty nasty out there. He's bored, rigid. So he writes to Captain Charles Gordon, who commands the USS Constellation, that's blockaded in Norfolk, and he says, you know what? You know that Shannon Chesapeake thing? Why don't we just, you know, got nothing else to do. Here's the Euryalus, so many guns, so many men. I promise that we'll, you know, we'll do this properly for the honor of the flag. And Gordon writes back and says, yeah, you're on. We're, I'm up for that too, because I've been sitting here for 18 months doing absolutely nothing, so, you know, why, let's do it. And the very next morning, a letter arrives and it says, war's over. So there was very nearly a chance for the US Navy to have a serious go at Charles Napier at sea. They'd, they'd agreed terms. Brooke and, and James Lawrence never agreed to fight. They, you know, Brooke's challenge never reached Lawrence. He went out anyway. He, he didn't need a challenge. So they, there was going to be one last frigate battle in the Chesapeake, which would have meant that instead of the score in frigate victories being three each, <laughs> somebody might have ended up winning. It would have been a, could have been four three. Um, I, I must admit, I do back Charlie, because I think he was very, very good. Um, but... Thank you. My pleasure. Um, this was a real treat, and I uh, really appreciate you uh, honoring us. Uh, I also would like to uh, introduce Allison Silverberg, our vice mayor, uh, the sort of heir to Mayor Sam. <laughs> you have some explaining to do. Yeah. I, I, I will accept your surrender. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I will uh, present to uh, the professor our seal of surrender. Uh, there you are. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor to be here. Thank you. Again, I want to thank McGuire Woods for their sponsorship and also for the Masonic Memorial and allowing us to use this fantastic space. So thank you very much and good night.